Good evening. I'd like to call our meeting to order. <clears throat> um, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, board member Kim Irby is on the phone and turn to board member uh, Deborah Knapper to open our meeting up. Thank you. We are now at approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? Is there a second? second? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. I would now turn to board, uh, board member. I will now turn to our attorney, Jill Wilson. Delighted not to be a board member most of the time because I don't have to vote on anything. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am here to explain to you the legal status and process for the District 3 vacancy. So let's begin. You'll remember that Pat Tillman, who served District 3, resigned on December 4th, 2022. His resignation was delivered to Chairman Hayes. He formally announced his resignation on December 4th, effective 8 a.m. December 5th, 2022. Remember that date because it's an important date. At the time of Mr. Tillman's resignation, we were governed in our organizational structure by state law 2013-361. Some of you, if you've been around a while, will remember that that law is what made us partisan and drew new districts and contained this language. Section six, vacancies on the new, because you were reconstituted, Guilford County Board of Education shall be filled by a majority a vote of the majority of the remaining members of the board present in voting for the remaining unexpired term. So you remember we have had over the last little while some conversations about that provision. It also said vacancies shall be filled as provided in GS 115C 37D. And it also required in instances where a board member being replaced was elected from a single member district, the board must approve a resident from the district when the vacancy is this. So this was the law as of the time that Mr. Tillman resigned. So let's see what 115C 37D provided. There it is. As you can see, it doesn't provide anything. Now, 115C 37.1 has four sections. There were three other sections. One section said that the board, remaining members of the Board of Education appoint the replacement. Another said that in the event that it's a partisan election and uh, it was an at-large election or there was no districting, the executive committee nominates. And then the other, the, the other section is the section we're about to talk about. So GS 115C 37.1C 37 is the provision that you have been um, hearing from the Republicans, they believe applied um, to the filling of this seat. It provides a method of selection of a seat to replace a districted member of a political party, which is what you had. Whenever only the qualified voters of less than the entire county well, eligible to vote for the member whose seat is vacant, and the appointing member authority, which is you, must accept the recommendation only if the county executive committee restricted voting to committee members who represent precincts, all or part of which are within the territory of the vacating board member. So both the majority vote of you and that process, well, something in 115C 37.1 applied at the time of the vacancy. Obviously, there was a lot of confusion. If you recall, all parties, the Republican parties, the legislators, various people consulted the School of Government. Everyone agreed there was a conflict in the provision. 
at the time of the vacancy, you got this letter, December 7th, 2022. Pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 115C37.1, notice it doesn't do A, B, C, or D. The members of the Executive Committee of the Guilford County Republican Party within District 3 met, chose, and nominated the replacement. Met, chose, and nominated the District 3 members of the Executive Committee. December 21, which was after you've uh, had the first consideration, we have strictly followed the appropriate statutory procedures to appoint Mr. Logan, abiding by the timing requirement of subsection B and the district voting requirement of subsection C. January 3rd letter, Mr. Logan's nomination was originally made by vote of a duly constituted members of the county's party in executive committee from district three. 31623, a new law is enacted. It, it, interestingly enough, it takes us completely out of 37.1, totally, and only rewrites the local law, which was, remember that 2013-361? That's a local act. That's not part of the um, partisan election statute that is in the general statute book. So you won't find that in your book. This is what it says. It rewrites that section that we just talked about. Vacancies on the Guilford County Board of Education shall be filled as follows. Section one. And you see the strike through when, I know you guys probably have read some legislation, but just for anyone at home who hasn't, when the legislators amend an existing law, that's what that strike through is. It shows what's changed. Vacancies on the, so they don't call it the new Guilford County Board of Education. Now you guys are old hat. Vacancies on the Guilford County Board of Education shall be filled as follows. The individual appointed to fill the vacancy must be a qualified voter in Guilford County. In instances where the vacating board member being replaced was elected from within a single member district, the individual appointed shall be a resident of the district where the vacancy exists. If the vacating board member was elected as a nominee of a political party, and just to remind everybody, Mr. Tillman was the Republican nominee, so that provision applies, then the board shall consult with the county executive committee of that political party. The county political party executive committee shall provide the name of the individual qualified in accordance with subdivisions one and two of this section in writing within 30 days of the occurrence of the vacancy. So you'll remember the occurrence of the vacancy was December 5th. 30 days, within 30 days of the occurrence of the vacancy. If the county political party executive committee recommends an individual in accordance with this subdivision, that individual shall take the oath of office at the next regular board meeting. <coughs> if the county executive committee of the political party of which the vacating board member is a member fails to provide the name of an individual qualified in accordance with subdivisions one and two of this section, in writing to the superintendent of schools, Within 30 days of the occurrence of the vacancy, the board may fill the vacancy by vote of a majority of the remaining board members present and voting in the next regular meeting. So where are we? We received this letter from the Republican Party. Michael Logan is the choice of the members of the Guilford County Republican Party Executive Committee from District Three. If you remember, District 3 is no longer a component of the appointment because we went out of 37.1 and became part of this local act that requires the entire executive committee 
to appoint a replacement, not the District 3 members. So as you see, and remember what the language was in the, in the letter that transmitted the appointment to you. They were nominated, selected, and I can't remember what the third word was, chosen, chosen by District 3 members. So as of this writing, the executive committee certainly has not voted or conveyed to you a nominee. If a nominee is not present, then you have to select. You have, because it's been more than 30 days from the occurrence oh, of the vacancy, then the, excuse me. the process of electing would fall to you. Now let's talk about why this is important, because I think it's very important. If you don't have a valid appointment, you don't have a valid board member. It's that simple. If you don't vote and the process is wrong, you don't have a valid board member. So when I started looking at this, I called Bob Joyce at the School of Government at Chapel Hill, who has been our guide throughout this process. Bob Joyce agrees that the executive committee at this point has not made an appointment and we do not have a valid appointment. And that means that the board has the authority and the duty to replace this person. Here's what has to happen. They have to be a qualified voter and they must live in District 3. Questions? Excuse me, sir. I'm sorry, but we have to have order in the room. We have to have order in the room or we're going to ask you to leave. Okay. You'll be escorted out. Thank you. Mr. Ritchie. Excuse me. If there's, if we can't have order in the boardroom, we will ask those interrupting the process to please leave or to be escorted out. We are here to conduct business. No, you're not. No, you're not. If you were conducting business, I would be sitting in that chair. Right Mr. Now. Logan, I'm going to ask you to leave the room. I'm going to ask you to leave the room, Mr. Ritchie. Anyone else that cannot respect this process, please leave the room now or you will be escorted out. I did, sir. Any questions? If there are no questions, is there a motion? Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion that uh, we uh, consider um, the um, District 3 vacancy uh, position for William J. Bill Let me show you how to do it, Go Tina Hayes. Goble. Second. Sir, please hand Second. Second. Excuse me, did you finish, Miss Bellamy Small? I can't I can't talk over that. Go ahead. Did you make your motion? Okay. Do you want me to do it again? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Madam Chair, I make a motion that the board consider for the District 3 vacancy. For the District 3 vacancy, uh, Mr. William J. Bill Goble for the District 3 position. Second. All right, all those in favor, if there are no questions, um, please use your um, electronic devices to vote. Kim Irby has cast her vote as yes. Mm -hmm. All right, that passes by a vote of seven to two. I mean, I'm sorry, five to two. Kim Irby's is, Kim Irby's is, can you push hers too? So that passes by a vote of six to two. What is the reason? Thank you. And Excuse me, but we are going to ask you to leave if you continue to disrupt the meeting. Well, you're not going to get an answer, and I'm asking you to, to please respect the process. Me you can handcuff me too. 
Attorney Wilson. Can you guide us through the process, please? Board members, we are so honored today, and I've been anxiously awaiting this day. I've asked her before, and she hasn't been available. And I'm so thrilled that we are lucky enough today to have Chief District Court Judge Teresa Vincent here to do the honors of swearing in our new board member. Uh, judge Vincent is the first African-American Chief District Court Judge in Guilford County. She has spent her life in public service as a district attorney and a district court judge. She oh, was recognized you by... Today, and you're she, she's recognized by the Elon Law School as the outstanding... Godless, woke, self-serving... Um, God Judge Vincent was the outstanding woman of the year for Elon Law School. She is currently the vice chair of the North Carolina Board of Governors for the State uh, Bar Association, which is an honor. It's always a great thing to be recognized by your peers, to be a lawyer's lawyer. She's a lawyer's lawyer. She's also a hardworking person. She administers our courts. She has been called by those who have honored her community-oriented, successful, and caring. She chaired for all of us on behalf of the schools and, and juveniles and people in our community, the School Justice Partnership. I know Dina served on that uh, group, as did I, and it brought law enforcement, the court system folks, social services, schools, all kinds of groups together to look at how we can best serve juveniles in our community who have faced, uh, let's say, unfortunate circumstances. So I'm very honored to introduce to you Ch uh, Chief Justice, Chief Judge Teresa Vincent, and we'd ask Mr. Vogt, well, I don't have to get you too far, come on up, and uh, we'll administer the oath right up to you. Okay. And good evening. Good evening. It's my pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, and so you will um, repeat after yep. me and say, I, I do. Okay. Um, and you will um, state your name. Um, I. I, William J. Goble. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and maintain. That I will support and maintain. The Constitution and laws of the United States. The Constitution and laws of the United States. And the Constitution and laws of North Carolina. The Constitution and laws of North Carolina. Not inconsistent therewith. Not inconsistent therewith. And that I will faithfully. And that I will faithfully. Discharge my duties. Discharge my duties. Of the office as a member of the Guilford County Board of Education. Of the office as a member of the Guilford County Board of Education. So help me God. So help me God. I. William J. Goble. Do solemnly and sincerely swear. Do solemnly and sincerely swear. That I will be faithful. That I will be faithful. And bear true allegiance. And bear true allegiance. To the state of North Carolina. To the state of North Carolina. And to the constitutional powers. And to the constitutional powers. And authorities. And authority. Which are. Which are. Or may be established. Or may be established. For the government thereof. For the government thereof. And that I will endeavor. And that I will endeavor. To support to support, maintain and defend, maintain and defend the Constitution of said state, the Constitution of said state, not inconsistent, not inconsistent, with the Constitution of the United States, with the Constitution of the United States, to the best of my knowledge, to the best of my knowledge, and ability, and ability. So help me God. So help me God. I, William J. Goble, do further swear, do further swear, that I will will, that I will will, and truly execute the duties, and truly execute the duties, the Office of Guilford County Board of Education, the Office of the Guilford County Board of Education. According to the best of my skill. According to the best of my skills. And ability. And abilities. According to law. According to law. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Your seat's down here. Welcome. We'll give you a minute to make any remarks, offer any comments. Quite a welcome. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't have many comments, but it's an honor and a privilege to serve the youth of my district and the youth of Guilford County. Um, I look forward to working with everyone here. I've got a lot to learn and I'm willing to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we are now at um, Employee of the Month. Um, Natalie Strange, will you please come to the podium? A teacher work day means a day of professional development for the district's media specialist who gathered Friday at Smith High. They didn't mind a brief interruption, however, to celebrate Library Media Services Director Natalie Strange, who in front of her family, colleagues, and supervisors was surprised with the news that she is the April Guilford County Schools Employee of the Month. Natalie's colleagues are quick to praise her wealth of knowledge, her willingness to help in any situation, and her advocacy in supporting the profession and increasing district resources. Natalie is one of the most hands-on library media services director I have seen in my 20 plus years of working in Guilford County School Libraries, wrote Nancy Cravey, library media services lead teacher in one of 32 nominations for Strange. She is regularly out, of, out in schools helping our school librarians reshape their spaces, their instruction, and their programs to better serve our students. She is thoughtful in her decision making always sure to put the needs of students first, while also advocating for school librarians to have the resources and time to build dynamic school libraries. Natalie's hard work and dedication have helped revitalize library collections, bring in STEM initiatives, and strengthen communication between departments so that our school libraries can collaboratively serve all our students. She is an excellent representative of school libraries in Guilford County Schools. Natalie received a $50 gift card courtesy of the Greensboro JCs, and during the month of April, her photo will be displayed at the district central offices and in the Greensboro JC office. At this time, I'd like to ask board member Chrissy Pratt to read aloud the certificate honoring Natalie. Natalie, 32 nominations. That's pretty impressive. I think that itself says a lot. So we're very pleased to present you with this certificate. It reads, Guilford County Board of Education Certificate of Recognition presented to Natalie Strange, Library Media Services for Employee of the Month, and it's sponsored by the Greensboro JCs, given in April 2023, and signed by our Superintendent, Dr. Oakley, and our Chairwoman, Dina Hayes. So, congratulations. Good evening, board members, board chair, and superintendent. It both honors and humbles me to be selected as employee of the month. This is a job that I love. My reward comes from working with Nancy and Priscilla and the 110 school library media coordinators who serve our students, staff, and community in Guilford County Schools. April is school library month, and today is school librarian's day. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to take this opportunity to share aspects of school librarianship. Our media coordinators strive to build balanced collections that represent all of our students, create welcoming, safe spaces for our students to explore and learn, craft hands-on collaborative lessons and engage students in active learning, develop community partnerships, spearhead book fairs, provide professional development for staff and support students and parents in an increasingly digital world. Despite their tight schedules, our school librarians take the time to establish personal relationships with students and staff. They take notice of individual needs of each learner and couple them with pertinent materials to facilitate learning. The commitment and hard work our school librarians put forth are awe-inspiring, and I am profoundly humbled by their kind words. It's my hope to empower our school librarians to innovate, research, and create vital spaces that directly impact our students' lives and learning. I cannot thank our school librarians enough for the dynamic work they do every day. They are truly an inspiration, and there's several of them in the back of the room now. Thank you.
Ms. Strange, we would like to welcome you, your family, and any of your colleagues um, to come so the board can congratulate you as well. <laughs> We will recognize our volunteer of the month for April. Would Mrs. Addie Jeffrey please come to the podium at this time? Is Addie here? So I will go with our next um, item on the agenda until we find out where our um, next uh, recognition is. Um, we have a special proclamation for our National Volunteer Week celebrated April 16th through the 22nd in recognition of the work of our volunteers and volunteer coordinators. Last year, over 5,500 Guilford County School volunteers contributed more than 109,000 hours of service to our students and schools. According to the National Value of Volunteer Time, this work is valued at more than $3.2 million. Our volunteers have made a precious and critical impact on student and school success. They help transform student lives every day, academically and socially. We currently have over 10,000 active volunteers exceeding expectations to support our students, staff, and families. According to the National Value of Volunteer Time, their current work of nearly 120,000 service hours is valued at almost $3.5 million. As a district, we are honoring our volunteers during National Volunteer Week and encourage our community to get involved by supporting our schools, students, and staff members in any way that you can. We cannot forget about the essential role of our school volunteer coordinators. On top of their everyday responsibilities, our volunteer coordinators take time to field phone calls, assist parents and community members, log volunteer hours, and organize our volunteers. To learn more about National Volunteer Week events, partnerships, and ways to get involved, visit our district's website, connect with GCS page or gcsvolunteers.com to apply to volunteer. At this time, I'd like to ask board member Linda Welburn to read the proclamation for National Volunteer Week on behalf of the board. The proclamation for National Volunteer Week. National Volunteer Week, April, 16th through the 22nd, 2023, whereas the entire community can inspire, equip, mobilize individuals to take action that supports our community and public schools. And whereas individuals, organizations, and businesses connect with local volunteer opportunities through Guilford County Schools to help transform learning and life outcomes for every student. And whereas during during this week, all over the nation the Gil and in Guilford County, service projects will be performed and volunteers recognized for their commitment to service, to service. And whereas our schools, volunteer coordinators play an essential role in welcoming, organizing, and motivating our district's volunteer force of over 9,500 individuals who have continued nearly contributed nearly 112,000 service hours thus far. And whereas our volunteers and volunteer coordinators, contributors and essential, are essential to the district success. Now, therefore, the Guilford County Board of Education 
does hereby proclaim April 26 through the 22nd, 2023 as National Volunteer Week in Guilford County Schools and commit, commends its observance to all students, staff and family and encourages all citizens of Guilford County to acknowledge those who serve and volunteer in the community and in our local public schools as we are truly better together. Thank you. We are now at public comments. I know that our volunteer of the month um, is on their way. So we will um, go through our public comments and we will go back to recognize our volunteer of the month. Um, our first speaker is uh, Jeannie Hunt. And we'd like to remind our speakers that as you come to the podium, we would like for you to give your name and your address. You have three minutes to make your comments. We ask you not to call out any student or staff by name. Um, when the amber light goes off, you will have 15 seconds left, and we ask you to write, wrap up your comments because when you hear the buzzer and the red light, your time is up, and we want to leave time for the other speakers to be able to give their comments in their entirety. So welcome. Thank you. My name is Jenny Hunt, and my address is 718 Percy Street, Greensboro. Happy School Librarians Day, everybody. I'm the school library coordinator at Southwest Guilford High School in High Point. And I'm also a board member for the Guilford Association of School Librarians, and I'm so happy for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I appreciate Guilford County Schools' commitment to staffing nearly every school with a full-time certified school library media coordinator. I know that this commitment is not present in all systems, and we all commend you for understanding the correlation between school libraries and student success. Many of you know a little bit about what we do in our schools, and some of you know a lot about what we do in our schools. And I thought about holding the podium hostage tonight until I list all the tasks we do, but I have tickets to see Ronan Farrow tonight at the Tanger <laughs> Center, so you guys are off the hook. <laughs> um, we're gonna remind you just of a few of the important jobs that we do in our schools. School libraries and their coordinators provide an atmosphere that enables every student to feel like they belong somewhere at school, a proven factor necessary for student success. We offer a place for students who need various working and learning situations. Our spaces are almost as versatile as their coordinators are, and they are essential to the school community. Building relationships with students beyond scores or grades is the reason most of us are in our jobs. Students feel seen in the library and that recognition is vital. For decades now, school libraries have proven imperative to a healthy school. States all across the union have shown through academic studies that school library usage correlates with language arts scores regardless of a student's socioeconomic status. In fact, good school library programs are most meaningful for economically disadvantaged students. Additional staffing, possibly in the form of part-time assistance, correlated with even higher writing scores for students, especially those students who are economically disadvantaged. Collection size matters, proven by studies that show that students of color with access to large library collections more than doubled their advanced writing scores. Regardless of the economics of a school, a high quality school collection in their library coupled with a certified school librarian ensures higher graduation rates. Educational researchers in many states report that schools are higher achieving when they perceive their school librarian as a building leader. We brought Dr. Oakley a present to commemorate National School Library Month. It's Nikki Giovanni's A Library. There's a little note inside for you. Thank you for your continued support of school libraries. Thank you very much. Good. Kate Guthrie followed by Christopher Godfrey. Welcome. Hi. Hello. My name is Kate Guthrie. I live at 2407 Camden Road here in Greensboro. And I stand here tonight as a grateful woman for your service. It is no easy task to lead our community in this way, especially these days, and I'm extremely grateful. 
I also stand here as a parent of a first grader. And I had the opportunity to pick up my son um, the week where they were learning about Martin Luther King Jr. It also happens to be his birthday week, and he happens to go to a school where there's a crossing guard who gives out birthday gifts for kids' birthdays. It's kind of a lot. Um, he got his gift, and he came back to us, and he said, wow, Mr. Johnny is so kind and generous, just like Martin Luther King Jr. There's a lot of emphasis on MLK's kindness in first grade. And I can only hope that as my children continue up through DCS, that their understanding of our history and the civil rights movement will become more nuanced and more complicated beyond kindness. Particularly as we stand here today, remembering the 55th um, anniversary of MLK's assassination. We all know he did not get killed for being kind. So I stand here tonight because I need your help. It is an impossible task to educate one's children by themselves. To help them become curious thinkers, problem solvers, people who can hold multiple truths at one time, takes courage, practice, and community. And we are grateful for the GCS community that they have right now. And I am asking you, the school board, to please do all that you can to ensure that teachers in our school system can teach our complicated history with nuance in ways that spark curiosity and conversation. I need my children to read books that complicate their thinking, that make them uncomfortable, and then to have educators and classmates who they can sit in that discomfort together, even if they disagree. Last night when I was telling my kids that I had the chance to talk to you all, I asked them if they thought it was important that racism and history was taught in school. And without missing a beat, Abe said, well, yeah, because if we study history, we can learn the things that we should avoid doing again or that we can do again to make things better now. Kids are naturally curious. As adults who are living in a cultural climate that prioritizes fear and division over curiosity and connection, we can too easily rush to assume that our kids can't handle the truth. But I wonder if it's maybe that we still have to learn to handle it and have a hard time with it. So I need help educating my children. So please help me and all of us to give our children opportunities to be courageous, inquisitive, and kind. Thank you. Thank you. If you like what someone says, just express yourself by doing this. Thank you. Uh, Christopher Godfrey, followed by Maria Adams. Uh, good evening. Uh, Chris Godfrey, good evening. 4507 Oak Cliff Road in Four Stokes. Um, I'm here today to <clears throat> make you all aware of the situation going on at Southeast High between my student and an alleged teacher. Um, he's being treated unfairly. The teacher, my son's a baseball player. He's holding back his grades. I think in hopes of making him ineligible for baseball until the administration stepped in and forced them to grade his stuff and enter his grades. Um, he makes snide comments and it culminated uh, a few weeks ago in the parking lot where my teach this teacher confronted my son, got in his personal space, tried to goad him into a physical altercation. And my son, who has more in emotional intelligence than this teacher, said, yes, sir, I'm sorry, and walked away and de-escalated uh, de the situation. And I think it's unfair. Um, any other workplace in America, you create a hostile, harassing environment. You try to uh, goad somebody into a physical altercation, you lose your job. And that's what should, should happen here. That's the only satisfactory outcome for me is for this teacher to be fired. And I have a uh, uh, rising eighth grader. So I have five more years with Guilford County Schools, and I don't want him to get to the high school and have to deal with this shenanigans. So I will come back every meeting for five years until something's done about this. I appreciate your time, and uh, I'm going to get out of here. My son has a baseball game at 7, so I appreciate y'all. Okay, because I was going to have a staff person meet you, but someone will follow up with you, okay? That's sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Godfrey. Maria Adams followed by Bill McNeil. Welcome. 
Good evening. My name is Maria Adams, and I live in Summerfield. And um, when I had signed up to uh, address the board tonight, I didn't get a response or a confirmation, so I didn't have a I don't have a prepared speech. So I'm just going to go off the cuff if you'll allow me to. Sure. Um, first of all, I'm shocked about what happened tonight. Um, I'm a supporter of Mr. Logan. He's a teacher that has dedicated 26 years to this to this school system. He's done amazing things for his community, for his students, for the teachers, uh, for the parents. And I just think that the way that you all have treated him in this manner, um, it's just really appalling. Now, I've met Mr. Goble a couple of times, and, and I like Mr. Goble, the very few times that I've met him. And uh, he and his wife seem like lovely people. And, uh, it, you know, I guess the consolation is that at least we have a good man on the board. But Mr. Logan is also a good man. And he's done amazing things for Guilford County Schools. And just the way that you've treated him tonight is just really appalling. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Bill McNeil, followed by Ken Orms. Welcome. Good evening, members, and thank you for your service and for taking care of our kids in all the schools. My name is Bill McNeil, and I live at 1014 Gretchen Lane in Greensboro. I'm a member of the Solar Power Now Coalition, calling on you to take bold, positive action to carry out the intent of the energy and resource conservation policy on your agenda this evening. First, thank you for having the energy policy on your agenda. With the climate crisis approaching more rapidly than humanity is able to respond to, clean renewable energy needs to be on everyone's agenda. Every community, every business, every level of government, every school system, and every family. The objectives in the draft policy that you'll be taking up are fine, but they don't go far enough. They're too vague, too hard to measure, too easy to put aside, as was done with the board's 2005 policy. Without a goal, your staff will not have a clear target and you will not have a standard to measure the progress of the superintendent makes on the objectives. We ask you to set a goal of transitioning to 100% renewable energy for all school operations by 2050. This is not a wild, unattainable goal Winston-Salem Forsyth Schools, Durham, and others have made this commitment. They're already finding creative ways to reduce fuel cost energy and reduce cost over the next decade. Your policy sets a standard for new construction projects at the lead minimum level. We would ask that you set it at the lead silver level that is attainable and will deliver dividends into the future. With costs of solar coming down and the cost of conventional fossil fuels going up, these investments in energy efficiency and renewable energy will pay off big dividends. Finally, I urge you to be as bold as you improve and adopt the energy policy tonight. We have confidence that the superintendent will move to implement the policy, but we ask for you to call for a semi-annual report on progress on all objectives and movement toward the overall clean energy goal. That way you can hold uh, the superintendent accountable and we citizens can hold you accountable. Do this to make a healthier, cleaner learning environment for all our students, all our teachers, our kids, and our grandkids. Thank you. Ken Orms, followed by Crystal Dixon. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Ken Orms. I live at 3525 Sainsbury Lane in High Point. And I have to uh, say that I, too, am disgusted by the actions the board has taken tonight. Because for the last four months, you have failed to do your job and follow the law. Democrats said they would follow the state law if, if Republicans nominated somebody that you liked. Well, it's not, your it's not your job to pick and choose 
which laws to follow or which board members uh, to, to pick. It's not your job to act like they're a pre prepubescent little group of children and try to shun and assassinate the character of Michael Logan or anybody else that you don't like. And I'd like to know who died and left you and made you the thought police. Your actions have been a bad example for children. And unfortunately, Democrats have a long history of promoting racism and denying rights. As a child, I was disgusted seeing Democrat governors and school officials stand in the schoolhouse door, keeping black students from attending schools and only to step aside when federal troops showed up. I've been disgusted when the, with a lot of Democrats voted against civil rights and voting rights laws in the 60s while Republicans voted for them. That's the truth. I'm disgusted to see Democrats praise West Virginia Senator Robert Byrd as a great leader, even though at one time he was the grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, and I hope I've got his title right. I wouldn't want to offend a dead segregationist. Or that Bill Clinton said a segregationist was his mentor. It's time for sanctimonious Democrats to come down off your high horse and join the real world where people who have opposing views can sit down and work together and find solutions. It's, you've got to realize that you don't have all the answers and all the right answers. You need collaboration, collaboration with people who have opposing views because otherwise you're just talking to the choir and you need to have opposing views so you can make better decisions. You need to listen to Democrats, you need to listen to Republicans, you need to listen to the audience here when they come in. And I think and I believe that history classes should discuss the good, bad, and the ugly of American history. And for God's sake, stop trying to rewrite, rewrite history or tear down monuments of important people in our past. People can learn from mistakes, but if they don't know what the truth is, future generations will only repeat the same mistakes over and again. If we nominate or we may name a road or a building or a monument for somebody today, 100 years from now or 200 years from now, somebody's going to say that person was a racist or they were this or that or the other, tear it down. So be careful what you wish for. You're liable to get it. Thank you. Um, Crystal Dixon, followed by Omar Huertas, Jr. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome, um, you all as well. Uh, what an exciting meeting today. Good evening, school board members. Um, my name is Crystal Dixon. I live at 1260 Westminster Drive, High Point, North Carolina. I'm an assistant professor of the practice at Wake Forest University. However, I come to you today representing myself as a concerned resident and educator. First, I'd like to applaud you all as a board for your courageous stance against bigotry and racial prejudice. Your leadership serves as an outstanding model for our students and teachers. Most importantly, it illustrates that when racial gaps are closed, it positively impacts all races. As an educator, I teach students from all over the world, but most come from Guilford, some come from Guilford County Schools. Our motto at Wake Forest is Pro Humanitate, which means for humanity. Our students are exposed to a cadre of topics that challenge them to embrace all historical aspects of our country, to expand their perspectives, and to broaden their scope for the good of humanity. Wake Forest is merely one of many academic institutions that are preparing our students to engage in a diverse world, to address some of the world's most complex problems at the intersection of social justice and human rights. Therefore, Guilford County Schools plays a significant role in preparing our students for college where they are exposed to diversity of thought, worldviews, and perspectives. Even our younger generations of students are inquiring about many historical truths, challenging the status quo, and are committed to making the world a better place. I had the pleasure of meeting school board member Alan Shirouse's daughter, who is an example of an aspiring young environmentalist who is questioning the unsustainable and historical practices happening on our planet. While there are many benefits of an inclusive and equitable educational curriculum, there are also opposing forces that seek to radicalize and divide us. These types of practices result in stagnation of the progress that you all have made collectively as leaders of our school system. There, there's active legislation and disruptive campaigns that are examples of divisive forces that are committed to severely limiting the teaching of accurate history and removing debates and engagement from history classes with the purpose of undermining efforts of your leadership 
and our public education system. The changes presented in active legislation significantly increase the workload for our teachers, decrease the validity of classroom teaching, marginalizes the experiences of many students, and create a climate of mistrust and hostility between educators and parents. This is a direct assault on our students and teachers and is robbing our students of the ability to grapple with challenging topics that will equip them to master critical and creative thinking, problem solving, and synthesizing skills, all needed to reach their academic potential in college. We must all value unity and respect in order to ensure that we do not rob aspiring students of a robust educational experience to ensure that they are equipped for college and navigating our society. Our students deserve to know the historical truths and have autonomy in how they navigate these truths. Holding our students accountable to an equitable learning environment is a step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and our final speaker is Omar Huertas Jr. Welcome. Good afternoon, superintendents, and, and to all of you who serve on the school board. I am Omar Huertas Jr., and I live at 506 Holt Ave. Um, I am a junior at Dudley High School. Having moved here from Florida eight months ago, adjusting to high school and, and a new city was a significant challenge. I identify as Afro-Latino. As a minority student at Dudley High School, it has been an interesting experience, but I, but I believe I have adapted. As, a t um, as teenagers, we share many similarities, but, uh, but there are differences that matters, and we are uh, not taught how to discuss them. Our racial identities shape people's um, expectations and ideas about who we are, regardless of who we think we are or wants to be. As, as, young, as a young person of color, I need to see myself reflected in the books I read and the classroom discussions. Um, it is critical that our teachers are not afraid to teach true history and are encouraged to support and supported to teach the truth. In closing, I want to emphasize that equality in education is just, is just a buzzword or, or a political issue. It is a real and urgent need for students like me who come from a diverse background and face unique challenges. We need leaders who are committed to creating a safe and inclusive learning environment we all, where all students can thrive and reach their full potential. I urge you to continue the par, to prioritize equality and education and to listen to the voices of students like me who are, diff, who are directly impacted by your decisions. Thank you again for your service and allowing me to speak tonight and have a good evening. Thank you. We have two alternate speakers um, because we have two speakers that are not here. Um, Christina Young, so if you want to speak, um, you're next followed by Risa Applegarth. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, I wanna thank you for your leadership. I have some things to show you. <laughs> I am here representing my daughters. My name is Christina Young. First, let me start. My name is Christina Young, and I am a resident on Ross Avenue in Southeast Greensboro, and I am honored to be here. I thank you for your leadership, and I am representing my daughters. And so this is my daughter. This is, these are older pictures of them, um, but they are students in Guilford County Schools. And I want to tell you a little bit about them. Um, they have done a lot. They have made A, B honor roll, and I've worked very hard with them to make sure that they understand the complexities of the subjects that they are facing in history and language arts and math and in science, but it cannot rest with me alone as their mother. I need your help to make sure that they are developing themselves and their minds as thoughtfully as possible. I'm concerned about the things that they've shared with me that they experience in their school setting. Um, there's been some good things and then there's been some concerning things. I've talked with them uh, for, I'll start with the good things. Some of the good things, um, my daughter reflected on an assignment where she got to challenge, this was given to her by the teacher, could she reflect on the benefit of Columbus or was he a terrorist? 
And so she, and this is a middle school assignment, she got to debate and hear what other students thought about that. And then they got to develop and she got to learn from the other students, how do they feel about this subject from history? If that type of opportunity is taken away from her, that limits her ability to grow as an intellectual thinker and her and, rest, and the rest of the other students. Um, so it was good that she had that opportunity, and I'm concerned that we are going to be going backward because of HB 187 um, in the state. I'm concerned about that taking away children's rights to learn more about history. Um, I also further talked not only with my children, but with their peers. And I found out we had a, a meeting at our church about this. We found out that they are still struggling with the impacts of racism, and they are concerned about what the teachers can do or not do because of how their lack of preparation to deal with these issues in the classroom. And so um, we talked about what can they be done about it, how can policies be changed, and this responsibility is up to you all. And this is where I want to continue to thank you for your stance against um, racial prejudice and to continue to support the good things, the opportunities that the students currently have and to not go backwards. Um, we need to continue to be a role model for the rest of the state. So I saw on your agenda where you and I read through this resolution to support equitable and inclusive education. I want to encourage you to vote for that, to approve that resolution because of what it says and what it will allow for the students to gain um, it takes a lot of work to raise my daughters and to make sure that they have summer enrichment and after school enrichment and to make sure that they're safe. Um, but I cannot do that alone. My church can't do that either. We need your help and we need to make sure that that is not taken away from them. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our final speaker is Risa Applegarth. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Risa Applegarth. I'm a resident at 2411 Camden Road in Greensboro. Um, I'm really appreciative of you all making time to hear from the public so much tonight, and so I'll try to be brief. I'm just echoing a, a statement that you've heard from a lot of folks. So I'm a parent of three kids, one in pre-K and two who are first, a first grader and a third grader. I teach at UNCG. I teach in the English department, and my students show up every day in in class ready to talk about the messiness of history, ready to think about, learn from complex perspectives from people who are different from them. And often what they do is compare with one another who, you know, they come from across the state, they come from across the country. What did you learn about MLK? When did you learn about the Holocaust? What did, what were you taught in, in schools about Columbus? What were you taught about Fannie Lou Hamer? When was the first time you were, you were taught in school about Malcolm X? So I wanna just, Thank you for the work that you've done to resist efforts to censor what teachers are able to teach, to trust our teachers as professionals who have the capacity to also trust their students and choose media materials. It was such an honor to be here tonight when the media specialist was being um, was being honored because I, I feel like that's such a strength of our district. And I just wanna speak in favor of that as an ongoing strength, keeping diverse books in our schools, keeping authority for what happens in classrooms in the hands of teachers who are the, who are the folks who have the expertise to know when students are ready to grapple with increasingly complex versions of our shared history, including the ugliness and messiness of that history. I want to go on being proud of what students who have been educated here in Guilford County bring into their college classrooms, bring into their workplaces beyond their time in our schools. So thank you for all that you do on, on behalf of that. Thank you. Um, we are now, uh, that concludes our public comment portion. As we uh, circle back to our volunteer of the month, I'd like to take an opportunity right now to recognize Guilford County Chairman Skip Alston is um, with us in the audience. Uh, welcome, Commissioner Alston. Um, and now we will recognize our volunteer of the month for April. So once again, would Addie, Mrs. Addie Jeffrey please come to the podium at this time. Addie is not your typical school volunteer as she does not always contribute her time and talents within the school building. Addie has supported several schools within Guilford County, but lately has specifically been a champion for the students and parents at the Academy at Smith. Recently, Addie volunteered countless hours working with school counselors, the EL department with Dr. Myra Hayes, and numerous community organizations to ensure proper representation and translators were available at bilingual parent engagement night event at, at the Academy at Smith. Over the years, Addie has been one of our major supporters and student advocates. Addie is always willing to provide her knowledge, expertise, and assistance whenever needed. 
We are very fortunate to have her on our team, says Ms. Atkinson, school counselor for the Academy at Smith, who nominated Addie. It is a pleasure to recognize you, Addie, as the April 2023 Guilford County Schools Volunteer of the Month. As a volunteer of the month, you were surprised with a $50 gift card courtesy of Rice Toyota. And during the month of April, Addie's photo will be on display at the district central offices, the Academy at Smith, and Rice Toyota. At this time, I'd like to ask board member Deborah Knapper to present Addie with a certificate of recognition. Mm -hmm. All right, and the certificate reads, Guilford County Board of Education, Certificate of Recognition presented to Addie Jeffrey and the Academy at Smith for Volunteer of the Month for April of 2023. And it's signed by Dr. Oakley and our Chairwoman, Dana Hayes-Green. Can, can I say something? Of course, of course. <laughs> We're gonna let her present you with that certificate and we would love to hear from you, Addie. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll just be short. I want to say hello first. It's hello. been a long time since I've seen everyone's faces in person, so it's it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I was really surprised when I was nominated by school counselor Gwen Atkinson for this award. She and I met years ago at Anytown as counselors at Anytown as volunteers. And for this particular um, volunteer event that we did, a lot of it was done by phone and I got to help include some of the speakers that she needed for this special event that they were doing. And I, I was very surprised to be honored with this award, but I just wanna take a moment to say that Gwen Atkinson has done a remarkable job as a school counselor at the Academy at Smith. I've gotten to see how she's affected her students and her students are so lucky to have her she's all heart and she really stands up for her students so uh it was her vision to do do this event and it's an honor to be here with her and uh principal rachel lewis who i think is still here <laughs> thank you for being here as well and inviting me to be part of the academy at smith family so thank you and well, good to see you all. <clears throat> good to see you too um and thank you and at this time the board would like to um, congratulate you and um, your family and any of the school uh, representatives that are here. Right. And Gwen will say hello from down here. Yes, the <laughs> ramp. Is... <laughs> we we can get we can get her up here. Gwen and I go way back. <laughs> that would be great. Why don't we go that way then? <laughs> You got to go back here. Mm -hmm. All right, we're now at the consent agenda. Dr. Oakley. Good evening, board members. Tonight's consent agenda includes the following items for your consideration. Approval of March 23 meeting minutes, the personnel report, class size update and waiver request, 
ACES fee schedule for 2324, contractual agreement with SAMIT Corporation for early release work for the Community Education Center project, contractual agreement with Barnhill Holt Brothers, a joint venture for the final guaranteed maximum price for the Faust Gaming and Robotics School Replacement Project, and subground lease approval with Gateway Research Park. This concludes tonight's consent agenda items for your consideration. Madam Thank you. Chair. Yes. Okay. I'd like to pull D. Okay. Okay. And then move the consent agenda. So from items for items A through C and E through G, uh, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Um, all right. Um, Diane, I'll start with you. Yes. Um, Chrissy? Yes. Linda? Yes. Alan? Yes. Betty? Yes. Uh, where'd Deborah go? Oh, we should have nominated her for something. Um, <laughs> Bill? Yes. Uh, Kim? Yes. And Deborah? Consent agenda? Okay, I didn't hear from anyone that anything needed to be pulled. Diane did pull. I'm sorry, this is E through G. I did say that right. Okay, gotcha. And Dina, yes. So that passes by a vote of, um, it passes unanimously. Um, Diane, item D. Um, Madam Chair, I, I'm concerned that um, the, I understand why we are having to increase the rate, but um, I, I'm just concerned that are we giving a, enough of an explanation as to why we need to uh, have a ten dollar uh, rate increase, uh, I mean, if you were here, what was that in two thousand and four, seventeen, when we had a lot of consternation about just you know moving it to five dollars, and I think we backed up and only did half of that. Uh, so, can we get some more explanation as to why we need to do a ten dollar increase? Yeah, as you know, the ACES fund, like the school nutrition fund, is an enterprise fund. So every, it's intended to be self-sufficient and operate that way. And when we rose the level of pay for classified employees to $15 an hour, we were actually operating in the negative um, in the ACES budget last year. That negative will continue to grow in the enterprise fund if we continue to keep those employees at a rate of $15 an hour, which this board committed to. Okay, um, if I recall, um, when Ms. Henry was here, one of the other things that had happened between when we stopped ACES before COVID and then when we brought it back that we did not, we didn't get the anticipated number of enrollment is that still the case or are we now, you know, filling the slots the way, you know, in order to to balance the budget? We're only, I mean, so that's why we only have 29 programs. We have 68 elementary schools and 29 ACES programs. So we're only able to get to that number. That number's about 60, the break even point to be able to operate and break even. You mean 60 children? 60 per students enrolled okay. consistently. And we're not we're not getting that. We are in those twenty nine schools. We have not been able to expand that. Uh, last question. Then. Okay, if we were able to expand, or do you do you do you have any? You know, not a crystal ball necessarily, but do you think that the program will grow uh, again, or or is this kind of the plateau where we're going to be? It's an ongoing conversation and evaluation of data collected at the school level. Right now we have two schools that are exploring the option of potentially adding um, for opening in the fall, but we have to get that commitment up front so that we're able to stay in a good place financially. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Um, all right, Diane? Yes. Uh, Chrissy? Yes. Alan? Oh, Linda? Yes. Alan? Yes. Betty? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Kim? I mean, uh, Bill? Yes. And Kim? I do have a question. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. In regards to the fees for ACES, um, is it possible for us to no longer charge the um, registration fee? It's really. Yeah, we're raising the weekly fee. 
It's really not. It's the only way that we know we have a commitment to enroll so that we can financially plan. Um, we're trying to keep it as minimum as we can. When we look across other programs, it really still is one of the best deals that we can continue to operate. Um, but we're really at the break even point and have, have considered each factor in order to bring this to the board. So does the registration fee get, can it get applied to part of the weekly fee? for those parents the first week? We can look at that. I'm not in a place to be able to answer that this evening. Okay, because we definitely have to do something. Because the registration fee, you know, the parent does all the work. They're filling out all the paperwork. So I don't know why we charge people anyway when they're doing all that work. So I still vote yes, but thank you for listening. Thank, thank you. you. And I vote yes, too, so that passes unanimously. We are now at uh, reports from the chair. So good evening. Kindergarten registration is now open. If your child will be five years old by August 31st, it's time to register for kindergarten. Register online at gcsnc.schoolment.net. All Guilford County Schools elementary schools will host a kindergarten kickoff event on Thursday, April 27. Find out more details on our website at www.gcsnc.com forward slash kindergarten. Congratulations to the uh, Virginia Tech women's basketball team for making it to the final four. Players Elizabeth Kitley and Kayla King are graduates of Northwest High, and we are proud of them for helping bring Virginia Tech to the women's final four for the first time in school history. Last week, Guilford County Schools was honored with a visit from Dr. Shavonda Jacobs-Young, the USDA's chief scientist. She spoke with students at Guilford Elementary about healthy eating and talked with the media about expanding access to safe, healthy, and affordable foods. We also welcome Governor Roy Cooper to Northern High in March to discuss budget priorities and the importance of investing in our teachers and staff. On a related note, our budget presentation will take place at our next meeting on Tuesday, April 18th at noon. Look for more details coming soon on our website. And finally, as if I need to remind people, but just a reminder that spring break is almost here. The district will be closed Friday, April 7th for the spring holiday, and most schools will be closed the following week for spring break. Uh, with students returning on Monday, April 17th, have a safe and happy break. Uh, and this concludes my remarks. Dr. Oakley. Good evening. As we just mentioned, April is School Library Month, and I want to thank our library media specialists for serving our students in so many capacities. In addition to building media centers, they're helping students become digital citizens and assisting with technology, more technology than we've ever had throughout the building. This week is also Assistant Principals Week, and I hope you will join me in celebrating these hardworking administrators. They dedicate long hours to their schools and provide supports to parents, teachers, and their principals in a wide variety of circumstances. Last week, I had the pleasure of recognizing eight treasurers from our restart schools who graduated from the new GCS Treasurers Academy. These individuals completed extensive professional learning to become leaders in their field. More treasurers will be completing the program soon. College Decision Day is coming. To celebrate the class of 2023, we want to hear from our seniors and share their college, career, or military decisions on social media. Please send a selfie video or photo and details about your post-graduation plans to goodnews at gcsnc.com and we'll share the results on College Decision Day, May 1st. Earlier tonight, we recognized our volunteers and I want to highlight again the value they bring to our schools and community. We're so grateful to our volunteers for sharing their time and their talents with us. I have been meeting with current and future volunteer organizations, including our faith leaders, League of Women Voters, and I applaud their dedication to serving our district. If your organization wishes to partner with GCS in a volunteer capacity, please reach out to our Community Engagement Office. Next month, we will launch our Better Together Strategic Direction, which is scheduled for Tuesday, May 2nd, from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. at the Stephen Tanger Center. I am excited to share what we have learned and where I see the district heading. Please RSVP through the link on our website or by emailing rsvp at gcsnc.com. I do want to take just a moment to talk about our students and their advocacy on two different issues, wellness and school safety. 
Last week, we held our first men student mental health summit with high school students from across the district. Mental health is extremely important, not just for our students, but also for our staff. And it's an area where we've been focusing resources and energy as we move into these next few months. I'm very thankful to the students who showed up, who shared their thoughts and ideas with us, and I look forward to more conversations with them on this topic. This week, students from across the country will participate in the National School Walkout to bring awareness to the rise in school shootings. Firearms have become the number one cause of death for children and adolescents in the United States, surpassing even motor vehicle deaths. Guns are too accessible and too easy to fall into the wrong hands. And while we cannot solve the nation's gun epidemic on our own, we must use our voices to advocate for common sense laws to keep our students and our staff members safe. We have to do it for our students, for our teachers, for our staff, and for our community. This concludes my remarks. We will now shift. I'll ask Dr. K to join us for a brief update on the energy resource conservation. Want to make sure that the board has this information prior to this evening's vote on the policy. While we get it pulled up, just a little bit of background. Um, as the board is considering modernizing policy 6530, which is energy and resource conservation, to establish a vision for sustainability beyond behaviors and programs. We wanna share an update on how this administration and staff is putting into practice the board's vision for sustainability, as well as providing some context for how complex this work is in the real world implementation. Um, and we'll give updates as it relates to the 2020 bond. Um, I do think it's important to note for the 2020 school bond projects, there were not specific goals set for the level of LEED certification, but all of the first six projects meet at least the LEED certified standard, and we do now already have goals that are specific and set to meet the silver LEED standards for the new set of projects that are covered in the 2022 bond. So I'll turn it to Dr. K to provide a little bit more information. Great. Good evening, Superintendent, Board Chair, members of the board. Uh, the policy committee, um, as our uh, policy committee members know, worked to revise policy 6530 energy and resource conservation this winter along with a group of other policies that are related to the long range facilities master plan. The existing policy was last revised in 2006 and uh, as you know environmental and climate concerns have evolved quite a lot since then. Additions to the recommended policy include a commitment to conservation and sustainability, not just in the way we operate, but also in the lessons that we teach our students about being good stewards of the environment. The revised policy reflects our current practices, such as designing new construction to meet LEED certified standards, choosing biodegradable and recycled products, um, and, uh, and in the way that we purchase items. This policy aims to represent the board's broad vision for environmental sustainability and GCS beyond our construction projects to include waste reduction and energy saving measures uh, across our operations. Oh, okay, sorry. The administration has also revised our internal regulations, which are the implementing rules for the board's policy. In other words, the regulations reflect how GCS will operationalize the board's vision. Some key updates to these rules include uh, that GCS will make a good faith effort to transition to 100% clean energy in alignment with federal and state regulatory requirements. We will inform the board about the design principles that are put into place for each project before we start the design process with the standard for lead silver as the baseline target. We'll share more about exactly what that means in a few minutes. The regulation also says when hard decisions have to be made during the value engineering process, we will prioritize safe, healthy, and innovative learning environments when making those trade-offs. And the administration will report annually on sustainability. Documenting these new practices in our policy and regulation represents enhancements to the sustainability and conservation work the district is already doing, uh, which include, I. Uh, which include activities such as scheduling our switchovers from heating and air conditioning systems, 
to minimize the amount of time that the systems are running when they're not needed, closing buildings over winter break and on Fridays during the hot summer months, adjusting temperature set points in non-occupied spaces during summer break, and limiting bus idling. We also wanna take this opportunity to update the board about how we are advancing sustainability practices in the recent bond projects and to share some information about the complexity of this work as some 2022 bond projects begin to enter the design phase. On average, it takes about two and a half years to build a school. Following the voters approving the 2020 bond in November, the district selected architectural and engineering and construction management at risk firms, held dozens of meetings to gather community members' feedback and ideas on what they would like to see in a new school. The outcome of the pre-design phase determined programmatic needs, conceptual design layout, and exterior elevations for the projects. From there, we moved into the design development phase, which included goals and targets for sustainability in these projects, which will be built to the standards for LEED certification at a minimum. As Dr. Oakley stated, we did not go into the 2020 Braun projects with specific goals for LEED certification standards. However, we have already met, goal, met goals to meet the LEED silver standards for the next set of projects. LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And this designation is defined by the US Green Building Council, the world's leading nonprofit organization for sustainable facilities and construction. To achieve LEED certification, the project earns points or credits for incorporating certain targeted features that address carbon, energy, water, waste, transportation, materials, health, and indoor environmental quality. Projects go through a verification and review process by the Green Building Council, and the number of accumulated credits corresponds to a level of LEED certification. Certified is 40 to 49 points, Silver is 50 to 59 points, gold 60 to 79, platinum is more than 80, and net zero is above 111 points. Of all lead credits, about 35% relate to climate change, 20% directly impact human health, 15% 15 impact, 15 impact water resources, 10% affect diversity, uh, biodiversity, 10% uh, relate to the green economy, and 5% impact community and natural resources. The LEED standards, like the field of sustainability itself, are constantly evolving. In the newest LEED version 4.1 standards, most of the LEED credits are directly related to operational and embodied carbon. So it's important to know that these standards do change and evolve over time. So the standards for any of these levels today could change in the future. Because of the potential for change and the costs associated with extra inspections required to commission a formally certified building, many organizations choose not to formally pay for the LEED certification, but require the design team to meet certain target criteria. This is how GCS is planning our facilities currently. All designs incorporate the baseline required features like reducing water use and preventing pollution during construction, recycling and hitting in indoor air quality targets, uh, and these project features are best practices that are prerequisites for sustainable and healthy buildings, especially after the pandemic. In addition to these baseline features, our new GCS buildings were earn, will earn different numbers of credits based on factors like open space and green space, access to public transit, designs that ma maximize daylight, and the certifications of the contractors working on the project. To earn enough credits to meet higher levels of LEED certification, larger investments are required. For example, enhanced commissioning or optional inspections of the building, which happened before, during, and after construction to evaluate its efficiency. That costs about $150,000 as a baseline. Installed renewable energy and rainwater management systems cost several hundred thousand dollars each, and advanced LEED designs need green features that could cause other operational challenges like reducing parking footprints, and green roofs. While not all of our projects are meeting the advanced LEED standards at this time, we are thinking ahead and planning for the new facilities to be ready for renewable energy systems and considering options for grants and community partnerships to assist with attaining higher certification standards. This is an example of the scorecard that, um, that makes up the LEED certification. So this one is the, the sort of tentative 
scorecard for the Community Education Center. And if you can read the fine print, you'll note that many of these credit earning opportunities are areas that we'll be able to continue to develop in the future, possibly through grants and partnerships like providing bike facilities. Here are a few highlights of the features of the 2020 bond projects that are currently under construction. We anticipate that one project will meet the standard for LEED Gold certification, one will meet the standard for LEED Silver, and four projects will meet the LEED Certified standard. As these buildings come online, there is still some uncertainty about the cost impacts of some of these features. For example, solar panels provide a return on investment and reduced energy costs to consider over time, and they also create an additional risk for roof issues. Projecting out maintenance and replacement costs for these new types of equipment is difficult. We also have new decisions to grapple with, um, such as will electric vehicle charging be um, paid for by GCS or paid for by the user. So our plans at this time reflect the board's vision for becoming more sustainable. The reality is that we would like to do more and attain higher levels of sustainability standards and we also had to make hard choices and some trade-offs during the design and value engineering process. We can't ignore that construction costs are on the rise, and part of being responsible stewards of resources is delivering these desperately needed replacements for our worst facilities on time and within budget. And with that, um, turn it back over to Dr. Oakley, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Diane. <coughs> Do we have an estimate of how much more it costs us to do lead? Or does it cost us any more to do lead? It does cost us. Gene, you probably want to just come on up. This is Gene Sides. He is leading the operations work in our interim. But it depends on which feature. Some of it can be built into the design. But yes, each everything we do in the construction costs us more money, um, which is why we wanted to be really transparent about what we have been able to do, what we think we're going to be able to do, and the rationale behind it. Does it cost more money to meet the LEED standards is the question. Yes. Yes, be sure you turn on your... There you there go. go. Yes, it costs a little bit more, uh, roughly around 2.7% more in regards to the actual cost of construction. Uh, just to meet the standards, fill out the paperwork, and then start implementing some of those structures. When you, <laughs> when you meet with the lead people, do they ever kind of kick back and say, nah, that's not going to work, or you just follow that little list that she had? Uh, yeah, the, we have to. It's just like a building inspection. Okay. I, my next question is, um, was there, um, did we participate in some type of sustainability with the destruction of the, of the um, buildings that were there, I mean, whether it was recycling or reusing, did, did we do that? Or is that even, does that count? I don't, I don't have the answer to that, but we will have to get it back to you. You mean like in the demolition of Peeler, for yes, example? Yes. We yes, can we find did. out. I don't want to, I, I don't want to say without having all the facts. Okay, because we, we're, we've destroyed, what, six buildings now? Or six campuses? I mean, over which period of time? I'm talking about the ones we're working on now. We have six current projects, right. but remember like the Brooks didn't require the taking down of okay. a building yet. So it will depend on the site, but that's details we can bring back to the board. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Um, seeing no other um, comments. Um, thank you, Dr. Oakley. We are now at um, the policy um, committee report. I'll turn to board member Diane Bellamy Small. At our March 22nd meeting, the policy committee voted to send three policies, uh, policy recommendations out for a 30-day public uh, comment for the period of April the 4th through May the 4th. These policies are policy 3420, student accountability standards, policy 3421, credit recovery, and policy 3460. Uh, graduation uh, requirements. The purpose of these policy revisions is to update the policies to align with graduation requirements of the state of North Carolina, moving policy information about credit recovery from policy 3421 to policy 
420 to streamline the policy, the interstate compact on educational opportunities for military children, and the North Carolina uh, School Board Association recommendations. Uh, as a reminder, we can, uh, you can view the revisions in detail uh, in the, the attachment to the policy committee report uh, in the board agenda. And uh, if you would like, you can also view this on our GCS website at www.gcsnc.com backslash page backslash 3882 three. Uh, and on our social media um, um, channels, uh, or if you would like for a policy to be emailed to you, we can you can make that request. Uh, these policy recommendations will come back to the board at our May meeting uh, after we have an opportunity to get public input. That is the uh, board's report. Thank you, um, Board Member Bellamy Smalls. We are now at action items. Um, there is a resolution. I will turn to Board Member. Um, Alan Sharaus to read the resolution. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for the invitation to read this resolution to support equitable and inclusive education. Whereas the North Carolina State Board of Education is charged with providing a sound basic education for every student in our state, and whereas in 2006, Guilford County Schools created the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion to ensure equity in the school system after a thorough analysis of GCS student data found that achievement outcome gaps were most profoundly noted around race and class. It also discovered that implicit biases existed that led to lower expectations for students from underrepresented groups. And in an effort to reduce these biases, the district began encouraging conversations about race. And whereas Guilford County Schools in 2018 adopted core values of diversity, empathy, equity, innovation, and integrity to demonstrate our commitment to ensuring equity and educational opportunities for all students. And whereas the North Carolina State Board of Education in 2020 passed a, resolu a resolution to support equity in education, wherein it stated that research shows that the physical, emotional, and social health of students is inextricably linked to their academic achievement, while barriers to success for many children include systemic racism, poverty, poor health, unsafe environments, nutrition deficiencies, limited access to services and infrastructure needed to support their long-term health and safety that will ensure their access to a quality public education resulting in rigorous academic attainment for every student. And whereas Guilford County Schools in 2020 established as its vision, transforming learning and life outcomes for all students, and whereas the North Carolina State Board of Education in 2021 passed a new standard for teaching social studies that will include a more diverse perspective of history and added language for educators to teach about racism, discrimination, and the treatment of marginalized groups. And whereas the Guilford County Board of Education supports educators discussing the accurate and complex fullness of US American history, and whereas the Guilford County Board of Education attests the 13th Amendment of 1865 abolished slavery, a system in which members of a particular race had, in fact, oppressed members of another race. And whereas the Guilford County Board of Education supports teaching about the Jim Crow era, in which a series of laws prevented African Americans from accessing rights such as voting or holding office, and whereas the Guilford County Board of Education recognizes that women were not granted the right to vote until 1920 under the 19th Amendment, and even then, African American and indigenous women were still routinely denied their voting rights. And whereas the Guilford County Board of Education supports the inclusion of guest speakers, experts, diversity trainers, and facilitators who have been active and vocal about manifestations of the structural racism that produces an unequitable outcomes for all students into our instructional spaces. Now, therefore, be it resolved 
that the Guilford County Board of Education urges the members of the North Carolina General Assembly to embrace equity as a framework that impacts students' academic successes and creates collaborative school and community relationships, and resolved that the North Carolina General Assembly fully fund the Leandro Plan to fulfill the state's constitutional obligation to provide a sound basic education for all children, and resolved that the North Carolina General Assembly increase allocations to match recommended ratios for school psychologists, school social workers, and school counselors, and further resolved that the North Carolina General Assembly create a comprehensive, anti-racist, and inclusive curriculum for every school to improve learning and life outcomes of all students, and further resolved that the Guilford County Board of Education urges the members of the North Carolina General Assembly to oppose HB 187. Move the resolution. I have comments. Okay, is there a second? Second. Thank you. Linda? I want to discuss why are bills like HB 187 being passed in a growing number of states. Violations of parental rights, student rights, labeling students, placing guilt and burden on students based on sexual ideology, expanded sexual content is not in the best interest of students. And parents are fighting back. Our education system is losing academic ground on the world stage and needs to focus on the core correct instruction. In the context of family law, parental rights are the parents' rights to make important decisions and to take action on behalf of their child or children when it includes education, religion, and medical treatment. Parents have lost trust in the education system. The education system has not been transparent. The education system has gone beyond teaching academic core subject matter and stretched over into social ideology and expanded sexual content that parents feel is inappropriate and beyond the scope of the sound education. These bills are about protecting the rights of parents and students. You hear over and over again, we are not teaching critical race theory. However, the Boards of Education, National Association of Educators, the North Carolina Association of Educators, the Federation of Teachers have publicly stated they will teach critical race theory and critical pedagogy. Education leaders have minimized parent concerns by labeling them, their concerns, a manufactured crisis. I believe the voices of these political organizations speak loud and clear. Student privacy has been dismissed by asking students to take multitude of panorama surveys which inquire about religion, socioeconomic status, political affiliation, sexual preference, etc. Who is utilizing this data and for what purpose? A student, a student and students should not be addressed in any manner or singled out during a lesson that draws unwanted attention to them in a negative manner based on their physical or social stat traits. A main component of critical race theory is labeling human and social characteristics to identify and define victims and oppressor. CRT is not a basic component of education. It is a theology that college students choose to take and debate. Another subject area is teaching true history. True history events should be taught the colonial settlement, civil rights, and the Holocaust as determined by age appropriate. Numerous speakers have spoken about the 1619 Project as history. However, historians have disputed the 1619 Project as factual history. Nicole Hannah Jones tweeted, I've always said 1619 Project is not history. It is work of journalism that explicitly seeks to change the national narrative and therefore the national memory. True history should not be about changing the national memory, but about learning the actually what happened without placing guilt or burden on a generation that is struggling to recover from the strains of COVID. Storytelling is a tenet of CRT. I, would pr I was introduced to social emotional learning six years ago thought it supported teaching lots of great positive character traits. However, in June of 2020, the Collaborative of Academic Social Emotional Learning, CASEL, included critical race theory. 
the Castle CEO, Karen Nemini, advocated that SEL to motivate students to be equity activists. Parents that for years have trusted the education system to provide their students a sound basic education and became complacent in the oversight of their child's education. COVID drew the, back the curtain to, to the system that has expanded sexual content, social ideologies, and invested in promoting social activist parents starting to voice their concerns vigorously. The National School Board Association writes a letter to the Attorney General, Garland, indicating parents are becoming a problem at board meetings and the Attorney General labeled parents domestic terrorists and enlisted the assistance of the FBI. Parents are fighting for their rights and their children. They want their children to have strong reading, writing, and arithmetic. They want factual history. They do not want their children labeled or taught to be activists. Our children are falling behind on the world stage. It is time to get back to strong academic, providing strong foundational education and enabling students to reach their future goals. Laws like these are parents fighting back against the system focused on political activism. Any other comments, <clears throat> Chrissy? So I've, I've read through this resolution a couple times and I've read through the law a gazillion times as well, or the proposed law, um, the uh, House Bill 187. And I personally believe that absolutely we should be teaching our country's history, the good, the bad, the ugly. We need to know the accurate history of our country. And I think that as a nation, we've fallen down on that, absolutely, in the education system. And I think that's something that you know we're working very hard to improve, and I love that. I also believe that we should be treating all of our students equitably and fairly, and it's my opinion that that is actually what House Bill 187 is attempting to do. It's looking and saying, we want to have equality and we want to prohibit things that are going to go against the equality of students. Um, things like saying you can't promote as a public school that one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex. Well, that seems like a good thing to me. I don't think we want to be promoting that one race or one gender or one sex are, are better than another. Um, so there are a lot of things in here in general I like this resolution, except for that last line about um, urging the General Assembly to oppose HB 187. If it wasn't for that line, I would be able to support what's here. But I do believe that the intent of HB 187 is to actually benefit our students and work towards more equality and less divisiveness. Thank you. Thank you. Diane? I guess the problem that I'm having is is the fact that uh, the the reality of history as well as the reality of the present is that you do have uh, attitudes of, of of superiority, and you have people who have benefited from the um, uh, from enslaving people and making money off of folk. Uh, you have had uh, people who we call marginalized, but why are they marginalized? It's because we have practices in place that have been in place and even are taught at the college level that this is the order of society and is not. And until we uh, help children understand, because they are the future, that you can't discriminate against people because of how they look or because of their sex or because of their, uh, you know, uh, whatever, how they identify themselves. Uh, and that, you know, we need to learn from the mistakes of the past. Well, you can't learn from the mistakes of the past if you don't talk about them. Now, anybody who wants to say that uh, my ancestors enjoyed being slaves, I got news for you. They did not. And there are too many stories of people running for freedom, dying for freedom, uh, you know, being lynched for freedom, uh, that, that, that you can't color this stuff up. Now, have we made progress? Yes. 
But that progress cannot be stifled by us being in this period of time where we want to pretend like the past didn't happen. That we want to pretend that uh, women did not get the right to vote until 1920, except for black women, because the deal was that black women in the South could not be a part of the deal that was politically made to give women the right to vote. Okay, we want to correct those kinds of thinkings, because guess what? The children of today become the adults of tomorrow, which means that they become the leadership of tomorrow. So if we plant bad seeds, guess what we're going to get? It ain't going to be a turnip. So all I'm saying is that let's stop trying to hide about the fact that you think that you and I are equal. We're not. We never have been and we probably never will be. The only thing that gives me the equity to you is that I have the same right to sit here and vote as you do. And I'm gonna use that vote every time. But you didn't, you, you know, it, it wasn't because of something you did. It was because it, 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 people said that it's, it's, it's a right thing for everybody to have a voice at this table. That's what this, revolu this resolution is saying that our children should have the right to be taught all of what is good, bad, ugly, and different about America, because that's what makes America, America. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, and I just want to say, one, I'm going to support the resolution, but um, we've been talking about failing schools for decades. I think it was Reagan in, what, 1983 that issued a nation at risk <laughs> warning us about um, the um, performance of schools in the United States. So this is nothing new. There's not some big landslide except what we experienced during this pandemic, but things have pretty much, um, you know, <clears throat> followed the same trend and pattern. Um, and I think that's just fear mongering to act as though this is <clears throat> some kind of an add on instead of something that is a part of the educational experience in every course. I don't know what you call, and I've said this repeatedly, but for the United States Congress to say if you want to be a citizen of the United States, you have to be white, to institutionalize that for 150 years, I'm sure that made a lot of people feel bad but it was the law. And to say you couldn't come to school here in Greensboro, that you couldn't go to colleges and universities, that you couldn't live in Fisher Park, the neighborhood that this school is in, you institutionalize racism and then say it doesn't exist. It has been weaponized and it is being used against teachers. <clears throat> we had parents that came here tonight <clears throat> largely white parents that support the complexity and the nuance of our history. And they don't seem to count to some people, but they count to me. And so I'm going to support um, this resolution and, um, and the parents that want to um, continue to provide the critical analysis, the complex and painful parts of our history in ways that do not denigrate children because that is not the purpose of the point. I would not stand for that. But we have to tell the truth. This school system, there is not one area of educational experience where there's not a racial gap, not one. Now I know some people think it's because people don't value education, don't discipline their children, don't respect authority, but we have gaps among children who are well behaved, whose families are involved and who are performing well, but there's still a racial gap. And I wish we were curious enough to say, why does that exist? And sit at the table together to try to figure that out. But what people have done is they have found a political weapon that they can use to incite a base. And that is unfortunate that it is being played out in school boards <clears throat> across the country because that was the call to action was to do that, and that's what's being played out right now. So um, with that said, we have a motion and a second. Um, you can cast your votes on your electronic device. Cam, you can tell me how you vote in just a minute.
Hmm. Okay, you can go ahead, Kim. Oh, thank you, Deborah. Okay. And that passes by a vote of seven to two. Madam Chair, do you mind uh, reflecting that vacant means Mr. Goebel, please? Yes, that vacant seat is Mr. Goebel, and we'll, we'll have time to enter that in for future board meetings. Uh, we are now at Diane, and I will turn to you for um, both action items B and C. I'm sorry. I'd like for it to be yours. Um, <clears throat> I think you can handle that. I'll turn it over to Dr. Oakley and Dr. K. <clears throat> Hot potato. Sorry. Uh -oh. <laughs> Action item B is the second reading of the non traditional academic calendars 23, 24, 24, 25, 25, 26. As a reminder, these come in the second wave after the traditional calendars are approved. All right, is there a motion? Move the item. Is there a second? Second. Any, any questions? Chrissy? I see here that it's noted that um, calendars for Greensboro, Guilford, and UNC Greensboro have not yet been published, and so there may be changes to align the spring breaks. How um, are we handling that with GTCC as well? I know that's a concern <laughs> that I brought up before about the spring breaks not aligning and parents needing to have transportation to get their kids during that time. I'll let Dr. K respond to that. We had some back and forth about it. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So what I learned about this, um, about this topic is that a number of years ago, the principals got together and made recommendations about what they felt like the right choice was for their students. Um, we have, students across the district who attend GTCC during spring breaks and have to provide transportation to those. And that's something that's communicated up front. Um, it is the recommendation of the principals who created these that GTCC continue to stay in alignment with the spring break. Um, it, provide, it provides consistency with transportation because of the ways that, um, because of the ways that the rest of the transportation system does not operate during spring break. So you're saying there are the spring breaks are going to be aligned? The spring, break, you're saying? The spring breaks are different for GTCC. Oh, okay. Um, the students still attend their GTCC classes mm -hmm. during spring break, okay. and they provide their own transportation for it. Um, what's different about the Guilford College, um, Greensboro College, and UNCG <laughs> um, calendars is that those institutions do not really allow our people to be in the buildings when they're on spring break. So it's not possible for the students to kind of maintain um, their their non-university uh, coursework mm -hmm. during the weeks that, the, that those institutions have their spring break. So that's the reason that there's a difference between them. Um, but the uh, it works best, from what I've learned from the principals, it works best for the families for the spring breaks for most of our early and middle colleges to remain at the same time as the district spring break. Okay, thank you for explaining. All right, if there are no other questions, there is there a motion? Oh, we already made it, seconded. All right, um, please vote on your devices. Kim? Yeah. Thank you. That passes unanimously. We are now at um, policy 6530, and I will turn to Diane Bellamy Small. Okay. I make a motion to adopt policy 6530, uh, energy and resource conservation as presented. Uh, the background for this is the uh, revision to this policy includes a title change to clarify the purpose of the policy. New uh, provisions in the policy communicate the board's vision and commitment to conservation and sustainability and reflect GCS's uh, current practices emphasizing sustainability and the effective stewardship of natural resources in planning operations and building projects. The policy will, uh, was posted for 
uh, a period of 30 days for public comments from February the 7th to March the 9th. 20 comments were received and are attached in the agenda. Thank you. Is there a motion? I already made it. She made Is there it. a second? second. I'm sorry. Are you awake tonight? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorta. Of. I'm awake, just distracted. Um, any, any, any other questions? I just want to uh, thank uh, staff and um, Dr. Oakley's commitment to us doing our due diligence to involve, uh, I think, the city of Greensboro, uh, the county, and other entities in in trying to put forth. Um, the, the best possible policy uh, that we could for, for the guidance of, of, our, of our school system. Uh, and uh, thank you to the uh, comments that we got from concerned citizens, and I know you will be watching. Thank you. Um, please use your device to vote. Thank you, Kim. Yes. All right, and that passes unanimously. Um, we are now at closed session, and I believe we have one. I'll turn to board member uh, Deborah Knapper for the motion. I move we go to closed session uh, to preserve the attorney-client privilege. And Deborah, Mike, hold Michael. Oh. Sorry, I'm sorry. No, I'm, hey, I can't hey, go with hey, Kim. Yep. Kim? Yes. Yeah. Um, you, you want to mute your phone? Thank you. I move we go into closed session to preserve the attorney-client privilege and to discuss personnel matters protected by state law. Chair sure, second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We will um, be long, Jill. Absolutely. I'm on the policy committee, so I have copies. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you.
All right, we're now back in open session. I'd like to turn to board member Diane Bellamy Smalls. Madam Chair, are we ready? Okay, Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, make an addend uh, addendum to the personnel action report um, for the approval of um, two administrative uh, appointments for deputy superintendents. Second. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, Kim, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Um, well, you um, weren't in closed session, so we won't uh, take your vote on this one, okay? But you can hear the results. So uh, she can vote? Oh, Jill said you can vote. Vote away, baby. I trust you all. Okay, so that's a yes. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, it's my pleasure to welcome Julius Monk as Deputy Superintendent of Business and Operations and Anitra Wells as Deputy Superintendent of Instructional Leadership, Wellness and Safety. Congratulations. Thank you and congratulations. All right, we are now at um, board member comments and I will call on uh, Ms. Pratt. Going out of order tonight, I wasn't ready for you. Um, all right. Uh, first of all, for National Volunteer Week, as we talked about at the beginning of the meeting, um, absolutely encourage people, whether you're parents or not, if you're just a community member, that's fine too, um, to get out to your local schools and volunteer and be able to give some of your valuable time to help our most valuable assets, which are our students and our teachers. Um, I had the opportunity two weeks ago to go to uh, Washington, D.C. to the Council of the Great City Schools Legislative and Policy Conference. Um, and this was a great opportunity to learn, to network with other large school systems across the country and be able to have our voices heard and advocate for our school system, not just on a local level, but on a national level as well. Um, classified employees your pay we hear you we've gotten lots and lots and lots of emails over the last couple of weeks um, about the pay for classified employees and we are looking into things to try to resolve some of the concerns that we've seen but your voices are absolutely being heard um, and we appreciate all of the input that we've gotten from everyone um, and I think my, my final thing is, of course, about the, the District 3 vacancy. And I think really the only thing I have to say about that is, is that the board is meant to work in a collaborative fashion despite our differences. We all come from different backgrounds. We all have different opinions. And the lack of collaboration on that and quite frankly being blindsided this evening I know at least two people sitting up here were blindsided, maybe others, I don't know. Um, but that does not speak to the spirit of collaboration that I hope that this board will be able to have moving forward. So, thank you. Thank you. Pastor Shirelles? Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to comment on the resolution that we have passed for equity and inclusion. Uh, I'm grateful to be a part of our district's commitment to that. I think that is important leadership within our state. And I'd like to say in particular uh, that I'm grateful to Chairperson Hayes Green uh, and also to Dr. Oakley for their leadership and for the opportunity to add our voice to those commitments tonight at a critical time uh, for our state. I'd also like to welcome Bill Goble and to thank you for your service in this role. Uh, I have said previously that given a vote, that uh, given the elected trust provided to me as someone elected to this office, that I would only vote for one that I expect the people who voted for me would want me to vote for and affirm. Um, someone with a demonstrated ability to collaborate, someone with commitment to the common good, someone who we can count on to be inclusive and supportive of all of our students, regardless of race, sexuality, or background. And I believe uh, that I have done that tonight, and I say welcome to you, Mr. Goble. And finally, uh, I would like to hold space to acknowledge the collective and personal grief and outrage that we all feel 
after yet another episode of gun violence. Um, I feel that. Our children feel it. They hold it in their bodies and in their minds, and they carry it with them. Um, I feel that with them. I feel that along with our teachers, with our school counselors. Uh, I feel that especially as a parent with others of you who are trusted adults in the lives of vulnerable kids and want to say that I know that all of us who are part of this board are committed to doing the most that is possible with the resources available to us to provide um, as much safety and security as we possibly can. There's been good work along those lines that preceded me on this board, but I want to say also clearly that beyond that, we cannot saddle our teachers, our educators, and our schools with the weight of a problem that is so much bigger because even in the last year we have seen uh, what security measures, school resource officers, secure entryways, what they can do uh, in the face of military-grade weapons. A friend of mine, Ben Boswell, directed my attention recently to an art installation by Cuban artist Eric Ravello that was banned by Facebook. Uh, this is an installation that is intended to expose issues plaguing children around the globe, including war and hunger and malnutrition, abuse, sexual violence, each of these assigned to a different country. But that's not why it was banned. It was banned because the image that the artist Ravello created for America was of a nine-year-old schoolgirl in pigtails uh, who was a victim of gun violence. And the schoolgirl was depicted being crucified on a cross of an active shooter carrying an AR-15. This week in the Christian tradition, we remember one who risked everything to stand up for vulnerable people, those who are suffering and exposed, including children. And we also remember that that is not the only crucifixion in history, and Eric Ravello's banned art piece has an obvious point, and that is that children are being crucified by guns and greed and apathy and impotence, and the fixation with the gun is an idol of personal freedom in America today. My children and yours experience active shooter drills. My first grader uh, told me how, Dad, we hide near the books in the classroom so that if somebody comes in, we can throw books at them. Guns are now the leading cause of death for children in this country, and no other nation in the world has this problem. Activists are working on it every day, um, but nothing seems to change. And we hear politicians and lawmakers offer thoughts and prayers, but thoughts and prayers do not save children. So I want to celebrate tonight uh, those that are still working, those that are still believing and hoping, and particularly students in our own district who are using their voice, uh, who are participating in walkouts against gun violence uh, through students demand action. And I want to celebrate them because they still believe that they can do something that this absurdity can actually stop, that this violence can change, that this senseless death and intractable division can have a hopeful future. And we must believe that with everything we have to. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, happy School Library Month. And also congratulations to Ms. Goebel for um, being the person for District 3 representative. National Volunteer Week, we ask that everyone please take time out to fill out the volunteer application and go into one of the schools, I have 126 schools. I'm sure that all of the schools that we have in Gifford County School will definitely um, embrace you and be happy to have you to come in and volunteer. For our Better Together last um, hosting session, we had a great time at Harrison Middle School last week. I'd like to thank Harrison, Bessemer, and Faulkner for coming out to support. Classified wages, we hear you. We received several emails. Yes, we do hear you, and we hope that you will have a resolution soon. We are working. Don't think we're not. We're not asleep. So we're doing the best we can at this moment. For the student who was struck by a vehicle in Stokesdale, we feel the sympathy as far as um, your pain as far as the parent. As far as the student who was shot but got gun violence on last Saturday, the parents, we feel your pain also. And this is why you will see some of us with orange on tonight. It's because of those two items. Last but not least, we have 
around $12,000 that now is the lunch debt. And that's something I promise you I will mention every meeting until we get to zero. $12,000, I know we can do it. Dr. Oakley said better together. So I'm saying better together, we can definitely get this $12,000 to zero by the end of April. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deborah. <clears throat> Okay, first thing, parents who are interested in the curriculum and want to know what is being taught in our schools, we would like to invite you to come to a resource review, family, community, students, anyone and everyone who wants to know what curriculum we're looking at. Monday, April 3rd, oh, that was yesterday, my apologies. Are both of these over? Oh, I apologize. <laughs> All right, I thought they were next week. My apologies. So we did have at two different schools, two different locations, two different times, opportunities for the public to look at our curriculum, to weigh in and tell us what they thought. This is your opportunity to give the feedback. Dr. Oakley, I believe, was, you were at both of those, weren't you? Oh, there we go. Our curriculum head, Juice Marmanis, was at both of those. And so I hope, I hope, I hope that everyone was able to go, was able to put their hands on the curriculum that will be going towards their students in the future and to give their feedback. Okay. And if we're going to go heavy tonight, I might as well top it off well, right? Um, let's start off with a, an interesting word that's taken some weight here lately, and that word is indoctrination. Defined as the process of teaching a person or group to accept a set of beliefs uncritically. It's taken on such a negative connotation lately to say the word indoctrination, but it is a reality of our life. We indoctrinate our children into our families, our social customs, our own religions, our holiday celebrations. Our entire society is indoctrination of our children and our upcoming into the way we live our lives. It's not necessarily a negative thing. Is there negative indoctrination? Sure, absolutely. And this impacts schools directly when people bring up items like CRT and continue to perpetuate that it's taught as a method of indoctrination in our public schools. Just to refresh myself, because it's been a while since I've looked at it, something I follow is the Lieutenant Governor's facts campaign. So I look back at it real quick and um, the instances that were reported of CRT in schools in North Carolina. First off, they were few and far between, not even one per county, not even one per two counties. Secondly, the bulk of the reports were actually um, professional development, what's being taught to the teachers, not what's being taught to the students. I can count on one hand how many concerns were expressed about what's being taught to our students. One hand, there are 100 counties in North Carolina, more than 100 school systems. The probably most concerning part about that report is there is no uh, resolution. It says that these things were investigated, but there's no report of those investigations. There's no report that any of this was ever validated. There's no closing of the loop on the facts campaign. So how would you ever know if any of those few instances of CRT were validated. You never would. And the fact that there are so few tells you that it's not in the curriculum in public schools. I don't know how to make it any more plain because the lieutenant governor went looking. And there's the results. They're right there for anybody to see. So I, I hope that genuinely helps. Our curriculum is out there for the public. I hope you saw it for yourself. I hope you gave the feedback that you needed to do, and I hope you can take a look at the, the facts that were gathered in the, the facts campaign and genuinely appreciate everything that we are putting into our schools, and most importantly, please support our teachers. They hear all of this criticism just as much as our students do. They have their own hard time and they give me their own feedback. I've gotten a lot of feedback about House Bill 187 and how disturbed the teachers are by it because they feel that they are being muzzled. And this is not just public school teachers. This is charter schools. This is private schools. They are looking at us going. The lieutenant governor went looking. 
CRT is not there. Why do they feel the need to tell us what to say and when to say it and what not to say when it's already not there? And I believe that question is very valid. And I would pose that to anyone in our House or our Senate here in the state of North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Goble. There we go. Um, I, I just have a couple brief comments. Um, the, I think because a lot of people don't know me, uh, I thought maybe I'd share some information about me. Uh, I was a church youth group leader for 16 years. I've um, been involved with the Boy Scouts as council president locally here and also in charge of 20 consuls nationwide and been on national committees for 16 years. And that's ending the end of May. Uh, I'm the oldest of eight. I had 66 first cousins within walking distance. This would not fill up this room. So I'm used to youth. Uh, my wife and I started a nonprofit called Youth of North Carolina, and it's focused on helping youth get through ACEs, that's acute childhood experiences, and making them resilient. And that's our passion. The fact that we're up here talking about critical race theory, I've, you know, I've sat in uh, cars with people, and I've heard them talk about critical race theory, and uh, I, let them, I let them talk, and, you know, it's always, this is wrong, this is bad, we're teaching kids. So I ask them, can you explain to me uh, what critical race theory is, and have you ever seen a curriculum for one? And none of them have. So it's kind of this feeding frenzy. I think, you know, we got to teach the kids the right things. There's no doubt about it. And we got to teach them the true history. As, as difficult as history is, some of the learnings. I have, a, I have a podcast with Reverend Odell Cleveland. It's called The Common Ground Show. And it's, it, the concept is uh, a white Republican that grew up in an all-white community with no blacks. In fact, if a black came through our town, they would escort him out. And a black Democrat that that's grew up in the projects of Charleston with a single mom who was handicapped, raised three kids, great-grandparents were slaves, and uh, we talk about how we have common ground. And we bring in a diverse group of people. Uh, we've had in, uh, uh, we had a bisexual pastor on, which I didn't know existed. And, uh, but we also had the son of the number one white supremacist on. And he talked about how he learned that his dad was a monster later on in life. And now he has a ministry that brings kids in from Romania. And he's adopted them. And I said, why did you adopt kids? And he said, well, when I was about 26, I was worried that I might get married and have a son that turned out like my, my, my father. So I got a vasectomy. So we've had, we have 100 episodes. I'm not trying to plug the podcast. But my point is that we're, we try and bring all that out. And, and I hope to find common ground with all you folks. I know we're going to disagree on things. Uh, I look forward to disagreements. But I also look forward to more agreements. Thank you for letting me be part of your team. Thank you. Um, Kim? Um, I'll make it very quick. Thank you, um, everyone, and welcome to Mr. Goble, to our board. I'll be a speaker, um, so it's good to have someone there representing District 3 that really wants to work on our board. I want to say, wish everyone a happy holiday. That's coming up. Please, please, please get some rest. Dr. Oakley, please get some sleep, get some rest, have some fun, all the things. And I look forward to seeing everybody when I get back. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Diane? First, I want to welcome Mr. Goble because my, my uh, <clears throat> derriere is on the line for you, okay? So, <laughs> so you just remember that. Uh, uh, Again, I want to thank Victor uh, Vincent uh, and the uh, reentry expert organization for honoring me last night at uh, Gifford College. Um, I, too, wanted to wear orange tonight for Jackson, who is the kindergartner at uh, Stokesdale. And I pray and hope that um, he recovers and that, um, you know, his parents hold him that much tighter. Um, my heart goes out to the schools and families that have lost uh, children since the last time we had a meeting. And um, I don't know what we need to do, but we got to do something because 
it, it's unnatural to, in, in, so far in the, just these two school years, we've lost 16 children. That's too many. And I mean, you know, a, a mass shooting, <laughs> You know, it's, it's, you know, but just singly. Um, uh, I would like for everyone to be safe during the holidays. Uh, really think about your safety. Uh, today is an interesting day because it is uh, the birthday of one of our Renaissance women of the 21st century, Maya Angelou. And she was an extremely wise woman. I, I had the, the great fortune of meeting her when she first came to uh, Winston-Salem. Uh, and to watch her over that almost 40 year span and, and what she has done, you know, and has still continues to do in this community is, is phenomenal. That's not a pun. Okay, uh, and then it's also the, the anniversary of the death of one of our greatest uh, uh, peacemakers, uh, Martin Luther King. So we, we continue to have violence, you know, dictate our history and how uh, we perceive people. And I want to finish with this. <clears throat> There's a verse that says, if you don't praise him, the rocks are going to cry out. John Lewis said, get in good trouble, necessary trouble, to help redeem the soul of America. I am disappointed at how our legislators at the federal, state, and local level are choosing to use their elected power. When I stand and salute the flag, recite the pledge, and sing the anthem, it is getting harder to see how I am included or those who look like me, poor, black, female. Though Langston Hughes reminds me, I too sing America. My people have been fighting for 400 years after being stolen and brought, to, brought here to build this country for a seat at the table. While, endure, while enduring beat, being beaten, hosed, bitten by dogs, lynched, kneed, and shot to death. Every day, rigorous, uh, rigorous attempts are being made to deny so many people who look like me a rightful seat at the table or simply a voice in the process through legislative efforts of gerrymandering and voter suppression. Our state legislators took three years to pass a budget, over five years to provide the poor with health care. Yet this same legislature, in a matter of weeks, passed a law to attempt to provide uh, an opportunity for a dominant gender and race privileged hubris individual a seat at, a, at this table without a direct electoral mandate. So I challenge our legislators to be just as expedient in the future with passing legislation to provide better pay for our school staff and our schools and pass this year's budget. That they move with the same speed to pass laws that benefit the greatest number of citizens. To stop diminishing the ability of local boards to govern and that they find a way to respect the will of all people and not just that, not just the economically powered select few. We, should, we need to look at public education this way. Education is the premise of progress in every society and in every family. This is a quote from uh, Kofi Annan, who is a Ghanaian diplomat and the seventh Secretary of the United of the Union of the um, United Nations, we tell people that if they see something, say something. I see, and I'm saying, I for I too sing America. Thank you. Um, I would like to again acknowledge um, our employee of the month, Natalie Strange. Um, my dear friend, Addie Jeffries, is volunteer of the month, and my other dear friend, school counselor, Gwen Atkinson, who I've been with since she was at Western. When she goes somewhere, she stays <laughs> and commits to uh, the students in the community. Um, <clears throat> I've gotten several calls and emails from parents around school safety, and um, it just there's just sort of this heightened um, concern, of course, as they see things happening around us. And I read an article, I think, about the shooting in Nashville, and, and one of the safety experts was saying that there's no universal school safety 
um, that is going to work because schools are so different. They're buildings that they were talking about technology. They were talking about funding. They were talking about, um, you know, glass partitions. I mean, just everything. And people rush to go and do those. And people have said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I have shared over and over um, the multiple strategies that we deployed um, and the press conferences that we had. I know, Dr. Oakley, you had a summit with students. You wanted to hear from them because somebody called and said, you know, what are we doing for the students? Uh, I know that there are going to be more of those. Uh, and one of the things that you heard is that they didn't feel heard and needed someone to talk to, so we strengthened our mental health services. So I just want to say again, and I know we'll continue to present information, we'll continue to work very closely with law enforcement, um, but that we are not sitting idly by um, and, and waiting for something to happen here. And the worst time to do anything is when we don't have enough information. Um, there are several initiatives happening in the community. Um, there are black elected officials have been meeting with law enforcement leaders. Um, this is unacceptable, the homicides that have been happening in our community, um, that it is unacceptable and working to provide support for that. Um, there are several community groups. I know Pastor Shirouse is part of DOPE, Dads Organizing for Public Education, um, and that's putting men in at least three schools. That's Andrews, Smith, and Dudley. And uh, uh, Jean Blackman, Establishing Safe Cultures is another community-based organization that is trying to work with youth um, to address that. So people are concerned and things are going on. And I know everybody doesn't know everything, but I just wanted to say that people are not taking these things lightly. And um, that um, the school safety experts said um, <laughs> that when people fail, safety fails. So it's not the, it's not the buzzer, <laughs> you know. Um, but it's, it's our investment in people that's going to also make the difference around schools. And I want to say that I'm very sorry that this community has been pitted against each other for the last four months. It was absolutely unnecessary. This board had, there was a process in place set forth by um, uh, legislators and elected officials. And, um, you, know, uh, you know, back in the day in the 80s, uh, there were buddy passes before all of the sort of terrorism in the skies. And you could just, if you were an employee of the airline, you just had this pad and you could just write yourself a ticket from Greensboro to Philly and just go get on a plane, no security or anything. And uh, I just feel like that's what's been happening with the legislation and the General Assembly. It's just like, oh, I don't like how that happened. Let me just write a bill. <laughs> I don't like the decision you made. Let me just write a bill and has stripped this board or attempted to strip this board of its um, <clears throat> processes um, that work. And this board, because of the errors made by the party making the recommendation, because, you know, that's how this happened. Um, this board could have appointed anyone. We could have appointed a Democrat that lost this seat by 80 votes in an election. And this board voted to respect the party that had occupied the seat. And so I know that's lost on people because people wanted something else and tried to use the power and to me, the abuse of power of the government to override a process that was in place. I'm sorry that has been your entrance. Um, I look forward to working with you um, and to struggling with you um, and to addressing some of the problems that sit underneath us. Um, so with that said, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. You got to move quick, Mr. Goble. They, when it's time to go.